very honored to be able to read with um, Nicola and Ellen and also Jess to be here. I mean, it's such a wonderful opportunity. And uh, when I was thinking about reading today, um, I was reminded I was um, some years ago, I guess it's been maybe 15 years, and I was working on a film project with a producer in London, and near the end of the project, he pulled out a video cassette to give me as a gift, and he didn't tell me it was on the cassette. And um, when I got home, at the time I was still living in Paris, I put it in, and it was James Baldwin being interviewed by the BBC in the late 60s. And the thing I remember, and forgive me, Nicola, because I'm going to attempt like a very brutal British accent. That's a bit of <laughs> otherworldly offensive. But um, the thing that uh, that struck me in the end, why we get to this particular point, was the interviewer said to um, Baldwin in a tone that would have immediately sort of put me in a docile position, but of course not Baldwin. He said, Mr. Baldwin, you were born black, poor, homosexual. Did you ever ask yourself how can I become a writer? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, of course this was the 60s and Baldwin it sort of perched up almost more sternly and he said, to the contrary, I thought I'd hit the jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for me, um, whether I realized it or not at the time, I feel like a lot of my writing has had to do um, with this notion of um, insider-outsiderness and these ideas of other but yet somehow being apart. And so, um, and like Nicholas said, I don't, I don't know that I really ever knew how to not include who I am and what I write, and so there seemed to be no other possibility. And I sort of imagined that I would um, somehow um, find the publication somewhere, someplace, and maybe just read in cafes to my friends or something. Um, but in the end, that's not the case. I, I've been, I would say, fortunate, and I think that that sort of steadfastness of being who we are and not shying away from that and looking at it as hitting the jackpot that we have then all the tools to write about the experience, um, the experiences that go beyond just the superficial or the, the normal and those things that we see. So, um, when I was asked by um, HarperCollins Echo Press to write the New Mexico portion of this anthology state by state that was sort of being grounded by Jonathan Franzen and Juba Lahiri and all of these people that I read and admired and had no idea that the editors there were even reading my emissions from overseas that I was sending here, um, I was really flattered, and they uh, asked me to write about New Mexico, but of course as a personal essay, it was about me, you know, where they say, write about an apple, and you write about me, um, <laughs> through the prism of the apple, but um, in that sense, and I was once again very fortunate, um, like Nicholas said, to actually even in this lineup of really strong writers get a couple of personal nods, even from the Times, and I'm um, even more fortunate to have my hometown paper hate me. Um, <laughs> partially because I think, once again, I, New Mexicans, the conservative Mexicans weren't so happy to be represented by this sort of queer, browner than standard brown New Mexican guy, um, instead of someone that maybe um, could look like they fit in there. So my piece ended up being, I think in many ways, about the layers of being other. The bulk of the piece actually takes place on a road trip when I'm with uh, my uh, partner at the time who was from France and we were driving through southern New Mexico, um, which was his desire, clearly, because I was <laughs> terrified of the idea. And it was during the Iraq War and of course there had been a spike in hate crimes and 
of course, he was French, so you know that sort of didn't portend too well. Um, uh, however, I think that portion of the archive is a little bit long for reading tonight, and I would just like to read from the, the sort of leading up to that in terms of where I establish um, just my notion of the state and my role in this state. Um, New Mexico. Shortly after my 10th birthday, I was nearly struck by lightning. It was mid-May 1975, and I was watching my two older brothers and their teenage friends attempt vague impersonations of Art Williams and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on the tar-paved basketball courts behind St. Bernadette's Church in Albuquerque. The afternoon had been warm and dry, the temperature around 75 degrees typical central New Mexican weather. By a quarter past five, when my brothers and I had finished with our after-school chores and regrouped with the others at the courts, the once bright blue sky was shaded with darker rush-tinged hues. In Albuquerque, violent flash floods and sudden lightning storms were commonplace in the spring. Our parents warned us never to play in the long flood-prone arroyos and always to keep an eye out for sudden changes in the sky. That afternoon, however, my attention was so fixed on my brother's game that it ignored the rapidly growing thunder crowds. Even if I'd noticed them, I would never have returned home alone. I was much too infatuated with my brothers to ever leave an event where they actually tolerated my presence. Besides, until that moment, the mortal danger posed by flash floods and lightning storms was entirely anecdotal. We'd even walked half a mile through an unpaved arroyo on our way to play ball that day. Then, suddenly, the, head, the hair on my head stiffened. I was momentarily blinded by an intense flash of blue-white light, and a thundering crackle filled the entire court. I was stunned, awed, senseless. When my sight returned, I looked up towards the clouds. They weren't drifting directly overhead, as I'd expected them to be, but instead had settled in two white columns that reached down to the base of the Sandia Mountains some five miles away. Off in the distance, ranks of electromagnetic bolts played a beautifully menacing game of flashes and strikes, exchanging frequent charges between the dis denser masses of humidity. The fact that a single charge had broken with the others to strike the ground less than 10 feet from me only reinforced its significance. There was no mistaking it. The strike had been an act of God. My eldest brother was the first to speak. Man, he shouted, that was so bad. Then all at once, everyone started talking. How did you stay so cool, little man? Maybe little man's not so little after all. Wonder what the others will say when they hear about this. My brothers and their friends had mistaken my paralytic shock for stolid strength, <laughs> a quality they'd never imagined existed beneath my timidity. I had always been awkward, too skinny, overly polite, bookishly shy. To make matters worse, I was one of only three black kids at Collette Park Elementary. My family, the only black family in our upper middle class, largely white and Hispanic neighborhood. As first generation black New Mexicans, we played no part in the state's celebrated tricultural heritage, Spanish, Indian, and Anglo. And while in urban centers across the country, African Americans were joining hands, taking to the streets, my mother was at home sewing her own dashikis and teaching us the black history lessons we weren't being taught in school. I felt completely outside, isolated, until that fortuitous strike. In the New Mexico of my childhood, plaster statues of the Virgin Mary cried actual tears. Mud pits in dying mining towns healed the afflicted, and the face of Jesus appeared on a flat white flower tortilla. Each miracle inspiring passionate pilgrimages to places like Chimayo, Lake Arthur, and various villages throughout the state. Such stories were frequently featured on the evening loos, lending them media-bolstered credibility simply because of the stir they caused in the local population. 
Moreover, in many rural communities, centuries of cultural mixing between New Mexico's highly dramatic form of Hispanic Catholicism and Navajo, Hopi, Utah, and Acoma religious rites had created an almost South American sense of mystical realism in everyday life. Even in Albuquerque, in a scientific family, I was susceptible to the tales of a wrathful Christian god and vengeful Indian ghost to hear the neighborhood teenagers tell it. Our entire block had been built over a desecrated burial site, putting our families at risk of being tomahawked to pieces by dead Apache warriors every night. The frequency of lightning storms meant most kids I knew already had a lightning story, but unlike mine, their stories were usually apocryphal or at best second-hand. <laughs> Cousin Steve or Carlos, who was nearly struck coming out of the post office with his mother, or an Uncle Diego or Mike, who was struck through a keyhole at his machine shop, or a friend of a friend whose vicious butt had survived three successive bolts before he finally rolled over and died. Now, at sleepovers, before moving on to frightful tales of the La Girona ghost sightings, I was invited to tell my lightning story. Kids I didn't even know ran up to me on the playground to inquire about the life-threatening boat. I was suddenly in. The only thing that could have made me more popular would have been to survive a direct strike. <laughs> My parents moved to Albuquerque from Chicago in 1965, the year I was born, after my father was recruited for an engineering post at Sandia Laboratories. Founded in 1949, Sandia opened six years after Los Alamos Research Center. Sandia's original emphasis was on ordnance engineering, turning the nuclear physics packages created by Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore, Livermore National Laboratories into deployable weapons. We were in the middle of the Cold War, and my father, like many of my friend's fathers, was employed as a high security level engineer at the labs. The specific tasks he performed classified top secret. As I passed from childhood into adolescence and learned more about New Mexico's recent history, the superstitions that had plagued and animated my childhood were replaced by a sense of foreboding related to my father's work and the secrecy that surrounded it. My teenage years then were filled with rumors of hidden missile silos in the mountains behind our house, rumors that my father played some role in stalking them, Rumors that these missiles put us in insignificant Albuquerque on the front line of a nuclear strike. I no longer looked out for lightning. Instead, I looked up and wondered when a barrage of nuclear warheads would come raining down on us. Fortunately, I had friends like Greg, whose father also worked at the labs. We did our best to diffuse our doomsday apprehensions by making light of the situation. We became avid Cold War spy movie fans, imagined our pocket protector wearing parents, playing glamorous roles in intricate plots to prevent the Soviets from destroying the free world. We took pleasure in believing that our phones were tapped. We were important enough to have our privacy invaded by the federal government. At school, we shared humorous stories about the convoluted explanations our fathers offered to describe, all the while trying to cover up exactly what they did at work. A typical dinner time conversation between Greg and his father reported the following day at lunch went something like this. Greg's father. Well, hmm. I guess you could say I designed very specific electromagnetic mechanisms that measure the existence of, well, the levels of, actually, certain radioactive particles in the atmosphere. Well, not dwelling in the atmosphere, but particles that can get into the atmosphere, by which I mean to say into the air, or possibly the water. Yes, they can get into the water, too, under, um, well, under certain circumstances and conditions as they don't naturally exist. These radioactive particles, I mean, either in the air or in the water, but certain conditions that might suddenly be present under extraordinary circumstances, or rather, a sudden and unpredictable circumstance created by human interference. Greg, you mean like if the Russians dropped a nuclear bomb on us? <laughs> Greg's father, have you finished your homework yet? <laughs> Still, as much as Greg and I delighted in our father's squirming to avoid revealing secrets they were legally forbidden to tell under threat of committing treason, no less, there were moments when we couldn't escape the weight of our scientific legacy. 
The day my 10th grade history teacher gave me a lecture on the terrors of Hiroshima, for instance, I wondered if she realized the guilt and anguish she provoked in many of us, children of parents who worked on mysterious government projects that we were convinced might one day perpetuate similar devastation. Years later, in the spring of 2003, my father and I had breakfast at the original Piraeus on Juan de Bo, my father's choice. We were um, where we often ate when I was in town. I was living in France with my boyfriend, Francis, but had flown back to New York for several weeks, having arranged my work on a film project there to overlap with a large-scale protest against the war in Iraq. I added a New Mexico leg to the journey to visit my parents, now divorced. Perea prided itself on its green chili sauce, which in New Mexico is simply called green chile, and boasted some of the hottest in the city. As an extra bonus, the morning waitress had a good memory and knew what we wanted even before we ordered two huevos rancheros, my, father with extra, my father's with extra green chili and mine with the milder red chili on the side. When she arrived with our plates, I poured a few coarsery drops of red on my eggs and then scraped half of the black beans away from my tortilla. My father grinned at this but said nothing. At 62, he is still a vibrant man, his general air a good-natured if paradoxical mix of intensity and lightness. He scooped up a forkful of tortilla, beans, and eggs dripping with green chili and aimed it towards his mouth. So how long are you in town for, he asked. Only a few days, I said, reaching for a glass of water. Francis is meeting me here tomorrow. We'll stay at Mom's place for the night, then we're off to visit the caverns. My father looked up from his plate. A lightly veiled cringe ticked across his face, then he quickly changed the subject. Knowing the extent to which he disapproved of my being gay, it was difficult for me to talk about Francis, and I completely avoided mentioning my strong feelings about the war. Since 9-11, my father had become increasingly conservative, an avid supporter of the preemptive military strikes that I oppose. So we talked about food namely the fact that many of the small restaurants like Piraeus had recently closed, making it harder to find really hot chile. We talked about my father's latest fishing trip in the Hamas Mountains. He always preferred New Mexico's heavily pined mountain ranges to its arid plains. And I watched as he became light again, describing the trout he'd caught at Fenton Lake. All the while, I could barely touch my plate. The huevos were much too spicy, even watered down and I realized I'd been away from New Mexico too long. I'd forgotten how to feign indifference when confronted by such a vast array of muzzled topics.